in the previous class we looked at description today we will look at another important pattern of organization that is process analysis so a process analysis explains how to do something for example how you play a computer game or how you change a tire or how you create something for example uh, you are planning to set up a bird sanctuary so how to go about it or sometimes it explains how something happens for example how the modern fire station has evolved so these are the things usually a process analysis uh, covers specifically it explains a sequence of actions with a specified result so i am uh, underlining here the process th that is each process has a specified result and it is divided into its component steps so basically uh, a process analysis explains how something happens so these th things are very important so there is an end result uh, and it is specified there are no um, options there there has to be only one end result then it has a, a series of steps which lead to that specified result so a process analysis basically explains how part of something so if you look at uh, processes so we perform various processes every day it could be as simple as making a cup of uh, coffee uh, or uh, preparing some dish or it could also be as complex as setting up um, an equipment in the lab um, it could also be something like you know how you withdraw money from an atm or how you deposit money using the deposit uh, machine and so on so it usually has some special techniques so i am underlining this so if it is something very simple very obvious then we do not worry about it so if it involves some special technique then it needs to be uh, explained in detail so based on the content processes can be divided into three historic advisory and scientific let us look at each one of these in detail first one is historic it is very common in textbooks and articles so as the name itself suggests this is um, something about which has happened in the past so for example how a social change occurred or how a law was passed how a war began so some event something which has already happened in the past so that is uh, explained in uh, historic process analysis it is often chronological so you can recall here that when we were discussing narration we focused on the chronological sequence of the incident so that is very important so when you are describing a historic process here again the chronology is very important sometimes it can also be organized by importance so you few things you think are more important so you could uh, those steps can come in the very beginning and those who think are relatively less important they can come little later now we will look at an example this extract uh, talks about how uttarakhand disaster happened this is from our geological survey of india report so let's read it and then we'll analyze it from 14 to 17 june 2013 uttarakhand 
and adjoining areas experienced heavy rainfall which was about 375 percent more than the benchmark rainfall during a normal monsoon. This caused the melting of Chorabari glacier at the height of 3800 meters and eruption of the Mandakini river which led to heavy floods near Gobinda Ghat, Kedar Dome, Rudraprayag district, Uttarakhand and adjacent areas. It was also observed that very heavy and incessant rains during the period resulted in exceptionally high rise in the river discharges. Discharges, the rise in the river level was of the order of 5 to 7 meters where the valley was wide and 10 to 12 meters where the valley was narrow. So, before we proceed let us analyze this paragraph. So, this talks about uh, uh, an incident which happened during this time in Uttarakhand. So, how that happened? So, first was this heavy rainfall. So, I am putting it as 1. So, this caused the melting of Chorabari glacier. So, this is 2 and eruption of the Mandakini river. So, uh, this I am saying 2 A and this is 2 B. Uh, these two things in turn led to heavy floods and the, these details are related to this um, flooding. Then it, uh, uh, there was there is another factor it was also observed that very heavy and incessant rains during the period resulted in exceptionally high rise in the river discharges. So, this is also a factor here. So, very heavy and incessant rains led to exceptionally high rise in the river. So, coupled with the factors described here and then this, uh, there was significant rise in the river level. Okay. Moving on, in the upper stretches of Mandakini, the stream gradient is high and valley profile is mostly narrow. The gush of water running down from Kedarnath and Rambada areas brought mammoth sediment load consisting of huge rock boulders diameter ranging from 3 to 10 meters. The heavy sediment load along with big boulders acted as tools of destruction and took away everything that came in their way. The enormous volume of water induced tow erosion along all the river valleys which in turn triggered landslides at a number of places. So, we saw earlier that uh, two important factors here led to uh, very high rise in the river and then the gush of water brought mammoth sediment load. So, this heavy sediment with big boulders acted as tools of destruction and took away everything and the enormous volume of water also led to tow erosion and landslides. So, this is how the disaster in Uttarakhand happened. So, this is a clear example of a historic process analysis, something which has happened in the past and now that is explained in detail in the chronological sequence as we saw in this case. The second type is advisory process analysis. So, as the name says this actually gives advice advises to readers. This is often seen in what we call self help books. So, how to um, become successful, how to have a successful career and so on that kind of self help books. So, anyone with a clear opinion can write this 
and a person uh, does not necessarily have to be an expert. For example, in the previous example that uh, Uttarakhand disaster, so that is prepared by experts. In contrast, uh, here uh, somebody with a clear opinion may be uh, has had some personal experience, has rich experiencing uh, from what is happening outside him or her. So, that is actually here enough. So, it is personal and explores the feelings and values of the person giving advice. So, this is very important. So, so, I may have 10 strategies to become successful in life, somebody else may not agree with that. So, the strategies, the steps which I suggest uh, are clearly based on my own personal experiences, my own values. It can be chronological, but usually it is organized by importance. So, you have 5 points, so you usually start with the most important. We will look at an example. This is called, it is, it is not rocket science, how to choose your life partner, written by Gail Brenner. Let us look at the text. If you are like me, no one ever sat you down and instructed you on how to choose a life partner. Yet, this is one of the most critical decisions we will ever make in life, with potentially huge repercussions for a less than ideal choice. A long term relationship can be one of the most joyous and fulfilling experiences life has to offer. Here is what you need to know to choose the life partner who is right for you. Consider qualities that are important to you. First, become familiar with the qualities that you desire in a partner. It does not matter what they are. What matters is that you are consciously aware of what is important to you. Two qualities you might seriously consider are honesty and openness or flexibility. You need to be able to trust your partner to be straight up with you about money, preferences, things they are doing, people they are spending time with. In addition, you will want to choose someone who is open to examining themselves, willing to take responsibility for their own behavior and able to move with the ebbs and flows of life. Know your deal breakers, only you can know your bottom line. You deserve to be with someone who is truly interested in making your relationship thrive. If you are mistreated or disrespected in any way, think twice before moving forward take very seriously problems such as addiction, large debt, uncontrollable emotions or severe mental illness. You can have tremendous compassion for people with these issues, but the likelihood of being in a satisfying relationship with them is negligible. So, here let us go back to the beginning of this. This is just an extract from this long article. So, as is clear, the writer here is talking about how to choose your life partner and the writer has some advices for that. So, what are the uh, things the writer here is talking about? The first one you can see here is consider qualities that are important to you. Why this comes? Probably because the writer thinks this is the most important and within here. So, according to writer which qualities one should seriously consider? They are honesty, openness and flexibility. So, again recall here this is completely based on the author's personal opinion and values. So, here author thinks these two honesty, openness and flexibility are very important, but for somebody else it might be something else. Maybe for example, commitment, hard work and so on. Uh, the second point is know your deal breakers. Here again uh, writer uh, list some serious problems such as addiction, large debt, uncontrollable emotions, severe mental illness, these things. For somebody, one who has unstable career might be a deal breaker. 
So, these things um, actually vary from person to person. Um, but as mentioned earlier, so one does not have to be an expert uh, to write such a, an advisory process analysis. Usually, uh, such advisory process analysis are about topics of general interest. Say here, how to choose your life partner. So, something which has a wide range of audience. Okay. We move on to the third type scientific or natural. So, this is often you find in textbooks. The goal here is to teach readers about a process in the world that we may be unfamiliar with or we have very little knowledge about it. So, it is almost always chronological in organization. One example is how photosynthesis works. So, this talks about a specific scientific phenomena and um, the idea here is to make readers understand that particular process. Now, moving on to the next aspect. So, when you are writing a process analysis, we have mainly two categories. So, they are called directional and informational. So, directional means you are writing a process analysis for those who are going to perform that process. So, in other words, you are going to give proper directions. The second one is informational. This is for readers who are not going to perform that process. So, the goal here is to provide information about that particular process. So, what are the differences between these two and when you are writing a process analysis, what steps you should follow. So, let us look at them in detail. So, the first one is writing a directional process analysis. So, as I mentioned here, you write for somebody who is going to perform that specific process and aims to achieve that intended result. So, this may be technical or professional personnel, say how to set up for example, split AC. So, you are the instructions are here written for person who is trained in that. Sometimes it is for ordinary people say how to set up a new smartphone. So, here you need to provide information to carry out a work related task or perform something for themselves. So, this is also called a how to do it paper. Very important thing here is it includes everything a reader needs to know to ensure a successful outcome. So, if you leave out something and the reader is not able to get the intended result, then it creates issues. So, when you are writing a directional process analysis, you need to include everything. So, we will look at some examples, then this becomes clear. Coming to the language part of it, usually you find polite commands and um, uh, sentences are short and uh, they mention very specifically what needs to be done and how can you be sure that that particular stage is complete. So, this is usually uh, find in technical manuals and user manuals. Now, we will look at an example of a simple directional process analysis. This is about how to remove chewing gum from hair. So, this is a very simple one. So, we will now look at a sample directional process analysis. This is about how to remove chewing gum from hair. So, let us look at the text. First, prepare an ice sack. Place several cubes of ice in a plastic bag 
or thin cloth, seal it, move the affected hair away from the scalp and apply ice pack to hair. Do so for 15 to 30 minutes or until the gum freezes solid. Use a rubber glove to hold the ice if your hand becomes chilled. With one hand, hold the stuck section of the hair between the gum clot and the scalp. Crack the frozen gum into pieces with another hand. Gently pull the frozen gum pieces from the hair. If the warmth of your hand begins to melt the gum, refreeze and repeat the steps. So, you can clearly see a typical characteristic of directional process analysis, polite commands. So, prepare a nice sack, place several cubes, seal it. So, all these are in command forms. Also, the steps are in chronological fashion. So, you start from the first step and then you move in the time sequence fashion. And also, you can see here, there are some precautions, some extra advices given to people who are going to perform this process. For example, so here the writer says, apply ice pack to hair. So, how long do you have to do? Do so for 15 to 30 minutes or until the gum freezes solid. So, the expected result is given here as a clear indication. Then, see here um, precaution, use a rubber glove to hold the eyes if your hand becomes chilled. So, you need to include some extra information as well. Then, so you perform it, look at the end of this, if the warmth of your hand begins to melt the gum, refreeze and repeat the steps. So, this is a very clear indication to the person performing it. So, if some this fails, what to do next? So, thus a directional process analysis includes everything for the people to perform it successfully. Another important context where we use directional process analysis is a user manual. Let us look at a sample user manual. So, as you can see, this user manual is about a semi-automatic washing machine. The, in the very beginning, there are clear instructions. Please read this instruction manual carefully before operating your machine. Retain it for future reference. Record model name and serial number of the machine. Please quote this information when you require service. So, very essential important information. So, it is given in the very beginning. Uh, so, that people who are going to operate this machine uh, uh, take care of it while using it. Then you have contents. This is a very sample and uh, an extract from it. So, uh, only few things you are listed here, but a manual can actually have many items listed. Then usually a manual has description of parts. So, here is semi-automatic machine. So, its parts are here labeled and they are explained here. And then how to install and operate. So, here again look at the instructions. Place the washing machine on a sturdy flat surface. Insert the power cord into a power socket. Connect the inlet pipe with the tap. Place the drain pipe near a sinkhole. So, all these start with verbs. So, these are all direct commands instructions and they are short. So, that people can easily understand. Next washing procedure. So, here again instructions put clothes in the washing tub, do not 
overload. So, short sentences again, turn on the water source and fill the water, add detergent and close the tub with the lid. Use the speed knob to select the speed depending on the type of clothes, gentle, normal or hard. Use the timer knob to start the washing process, set the time according to the level of dirt. So, again what specifications are available are listed here. The timer stops automatically and sounds a beep. Use the drain knob to drain out the water. For rinsing, repeat the same steps without adding a detergent. For drying, put the clothes in the dryer tub, close the lid, use the dryer knob to set the time. So, again different possibilities here. The tub stops automatically after the stipulated time. So, any user manual has how to install instructions, then how to use it instructions, then there are safety precautions. So, be sure that the washing machine is grounded, do not use water hotter than 50 degrees centigrade for washing clothes, never touch laundry during wash and spin, never splash water on control panel and so on. So, a list of uh, precautions a person needs to keep in mind. Then another important section is troubleshooting. So, there is a trouble what the user can do uh, immediately even before consulting a technician. So, if the machine does not work, what you can do? Check if the power cord is plugged in properly. So, similarly, clothes inside the tub do not move, it may be overloaded, check load limit. Water does not drain, make sure the drain pipe is laid flat on ground and sinkhole is um, not blocked. The water is not stored in wash tub, so make sure the drain knob is not set to drain, so and so on. Simple steps which um, a user has to follow. Then if these things do not help, so who should you contact? So, these are contact details of service centers. Usually, they list major service centers and um, uh, their contact numbers and address among other things. So, when you are preparing a user manual, we need to keep following points in mind. So, as mentioned, you need to include all steps and arrange them in the proper sequence. Then explain why each step is necessary and include warnings where appropriate. Define any terms that your readers may not be familiar with. So, in the previous example of how to remove chewing gum, we saw that, that there were no technical terms and hence there was no need for any definition, but the writer had included warnings and um, few things to do if whatever has been suggested does not work. So, if you are preparing a manual about a more complicated process, then you ne may need to define it and include warnings as well. Also, offer clear descriptions of any tools, materials or equipment needed to carry out the process. So, in that example, uh, how to remove chewing gum, uh, things needed were a sack of ice. So, how you tie it, um, what you use, the process mentions use rubber gloves and so on. Then, provide your readers with a way of determining whether or not the process has been carried out successfully. So, how do readers know that the process is successful? So, you may simply say, now the screen um, switches on, then your setup is complete. So, this gives a clear indication that the process has been completed successfully. Ensure that the reader can duplicate the process or understand how it unfolds. So, this is the major challenge when preparing a user manual. So, fully detail each step and specify the reasons for it. Make it clear to the reader the sequence of steps, their duration and where they occur. 
the chronology may contain occasional interruptions or modifications. It may require background information, definitions of specialized terms, examples or precautions among other things. Now, moving on the second type is informational. So, here you are writing about a process, but you do not expect your reader to perform it. This is mainly for the purposes of understanding that specific process. So, you explain how a process is performed, how some phenomena occurs. So, usually you find it in research papers, textbooks, encyclopedias, research reports. One example which we saw Uttarakhand disaster, that is an example of informational process analysis. So, in contrast to directional process analysis, you will not find polite commands here. Pronouns are used to refer to a performer in directional process analysis, whereas here it is an unidentified performer. So, basically you are explaining the process. Let us look at an example here how reflex arcs work. Reflex arcs are connections between sensory neurons, the spinal cord and motor neurons. They are good examples of how the nervous system protects you by making you get out of danger almost before you realize you are in danger. Here is an example. You are cooking dinner and you accidentally grab the lid of a pot without using a hot pad. You just want to check on the vegetables. Your nervous system has other ideas. So, as you can see, this is about how reflex arcs work. The first paragraph actually defines what this means. So, this is a technical term, many people may not be aware of it. So, that is defined here and then the writer uses an example to explain this, because this is for common people and if the writer uses only technical terms, then it may be inaccessible to general public. So, let us look at the rest of the text. Point number 1, when you grab that hot light, the endings of the sensory nerves in your skin detect the heat and send an impulse up through the axon of a sensory neuron to the nerve cell body of the sensory neuron. 2, the impulse continues through sensory neurons until it reaches an interneuron in the spinal cord. The interneuron determines the appropriate response, which in this case would be stimulating the muscles to pull your hand away. The excitatory impulse is transferred to the cell body of a motor neuron and travels down the axon of the motor neuron until it reaches muscle tissue. The muscle responds by contracting to pull your hand away from the hot lid. So, there are three steps in this and these three things are clearly numbered and clearly separated with the help of paragraphing technique. The concluding paragraph, with all these words describing what happens, it makes it seem like this process takes quite a while. But think about when you touch something hot by mistake, you pulled your hand away immediately thanks to a quick reacting reflex arc. Without the reflex arc protecting you, you might just unknowingly hold that hot lid in your hand until real damage is done. So, this winds up the process analysis by saying that this does not take much time, this happens very quickly and uh, with a funny um, touch it ends. So, in contrast to directional process analysis, here you see that there are no commands here. Instead, uh, there is use of present tense, simple present tense. So, detect, send, then the impulse continues, determines. 
So, is transferred sometimes passive structure is used um, and then these things are again organized in a chronological fashion. So, the basic purpose here is to explain how reflex arcs work. So, now let us look at a longer text and understand the process analysis. So, this is on how does a nuclear power plant work. So, this is again informational in nature. The writer whoever has prepared this does not intend the reader to perform it. The idea here is readers read it and understand the process. Process here is how a nuclear power plant works. So, let us look at the text. Nuclear reactors which produce heat by splitting uranium atoms do the same job as conventional power producing equipment in the generation of electricity. They produce heat to convert water into steam which spins a turbine or generator to make electricity. Instead of coal, oil or natural gas, Canadian nuclear reactors use natural uranium for fuel, but the uranium is not burned. Uranium atoms make heat by splitting. The technical term is fissioning. So, what is the purpose of this introductory paragraph? It introduces nuclear reactors and it very briefly tells what a nuclear reactor does. So, it produces heat by splitting uranium atoms. Um, the functioning of uh, nuclear reactors is compared with that of conventional power producing equipment using water or coal, oil and so on. This is prepared by Canadian government. So, this talks about Canadian nuclear reactors very specific in a specific manner. Then this introduces the term fissioning at the end of this. The next paragraph explains this process in detail. Fission makes heat. When a neutron, a tiny subatomic particle that is one of the components of almost all atoms strikes an atom of uranium. The uranium atom splits into two lighter atoms which are called fission products and releases heat at the same time. The fissioning process also releases from one, also releases from one to three more neutrons that can split other uranium atoms. This is the beginning of a chain reaction in which more and more uranium atoms are split releasing more and more neutrons and heat. In a power reactor, the chain reaction is tightly controlled to produce only the amount of heat needed to generate a specific amount of electricity. So, the introductory paragraph very briefly explains the process and the rest of the text goes into detail. So, the first paragraph focuses on this process called fissioning. So, if you look at this, when a neutron, then what is a neutron? It is defined here. Then um, it strikes an atom of uranium and it is split into two lighter things and this is the process of fission. It also releases at the same time and then it introduces the term chain reaction. So, what is it? More and more uranium atoms are split releasing more and more neutrons and heat. Then um, there is extra information here. This chain reaction is not uncontrolled. It is tightly controlled to produce only the amount of heat needed to generate specific amount of electricity. So, uh, this explains in detail about fission. Then the next is, so heat is produced here um, because of this process of fission. Then that is heat is used to make steam the fission process generates a huge amount of heat. In order to be useful, the heat has to be moved to boilers to make steam. In a CANGU, can do 
reactor, heavy water does this job. It is pumped constantly through the fuel channels in the reactor and takes the heat from the fuel bundles up to boilers above the reactor. In the boilers, the heated heavy water heats up ordinary water to make steam. The steam is piped out of the boilers and over to the turbine hall, where it drives the huge turbine generators that make the electricity we use. So, then it explains that heat um, converts heavy water and then that heated heavy water heats up ordinary water and converts it to steam. So, that steam you know is uh, used to drive huge turbine generators, which in turn uh, generate the electricity. So, this is the second uh, step in generating electricity. Creating a chain reaction, Canadian reactors use fuel made of natural uranium. Like uranium in the ground, almost all of the uranium in Kandur fuel is U23, U238. This is the common form of the element. The ore also contains tiny amounts 0.7 percent of U235, an unstable isotope of uranium that fission spontaneously. That is why Geiger counters react to ore carrying rock. The fact that U235 atoms fission spontaneously makes it possible to get a control chain reaction going inside the mass of fuel in the reactor but no chain reaction can take place in this fuel unless three conditions are all satisfied at the same time. Several tons of fuel are present, the tubes containing the fuel are st stacked in a special arrangement, neither too close together nor too far apart and a material called a moderator surrounds the fuel. The moderator slows or moderates the speed of the neutrons resulting from the fission, so they are more likely to collide with and split more uranium atoms. The moderator in Canadian reactors is heavy water, which is very efficient at slowing down neutrons while not absorbing too many of them. Heavy water is 10 percent heavier than ordinary water, because it incorporates a heavy form of hydrogen called deuterium. deuterium. So, here this gives more details about fission process and more information about uranium fuel. So, the in this way the text you can see here, it goes on to then talk about reactor fuel. So, here it talks about a special arrangement, what is that? That is explained here. Then this talks about calandria, it is the tank and then the, it also talks about safety in reactor control here, then containment measures. So, let us look at this. So, what happens if there is an accident? Each of Ontario power generations reactors are enclosed in a sealed reactor building with steel reinforced concrete walls over a meter thick. The reactor building is connected by a large duct to the vacuum building a large silo like structure, which is maintained as a vacuum. So, these, this is information about uh, the reactor building and a vacuum building. In the extremely unlikely event of a large leak, now it explains the process. In the reactor cooling system, steam and water would be released into the reactor building. So, this is step 1. The pressure would rise opening large fast acting walls connecting the vacuum building to the reactor building. So, this is step 2. The steam and any radioactive material would be vacuumed into the vacuum building. So, this is 3. Once it reaches the vacuum building to be condensed and cooled by water sprays from the dowsing tank located at the top of the vacuum building. So, this is the next step. The pressure inside the vacuum building and reactor building would stabilize at below atmospheric pressure. It would remain at that level for about a day or two, during which time short lived radionuclides would decay. Many radioactive particles would attach or plate onto the vacuum building walls and the accident would stabilize. 
So, that is how uh, the process actually continues. So, you can here see some typical characteristics of an informational process analysis that is the use of uh, present tense and use of passive voice or past participles here is connected or enclosed. Steam and water would be released, the pressure would rise. So, this is you know hypothetical situation. So, therefore, um, so you are here you can see the produce present tense use is not burnt, this is participial adjective, they make heat. So, uh, use of present tense, passive voice and past participles uh, to explain a scientific process. Also, the process steps are explained in the chronological fashion. So, this is how you can work on an informational process analysis. So, moving on, if you are writing a process, so what you can do? First is you need to list, list phases, stages, steps in detail and identify every important action. So, we saw example how to break chewing gum. So, every step is explained there, every possible action is included. Similarly, in the text about containment procedure, so every step is explained there. So, nothing is left out, not even single detail is left out. So, think of a proper sequence. So, are you going to follow chronological sequence or are you going to arrange points according to the relative importance. So, sometimes you have no choice say uh, as in the case of removing bubble gum, it has to be in a chronological fashion and uh, a nuclear reactor that again it has to be in a chronological fashion. If you are preparing an advisory uh, process analysis then you can arrange points according to the relative importance. Then you need to use transition words. Uh, so, we will look at some examples. Then as I mentioned, we use mostly present tense and we also use passive voice and note that is more formal and when you do not want to identify the agent who is performing it. So, if it is a directional process analysis, we do not use passive voice, there are direct commands. If it is an informational process analysis, then we use passive voice. So, some examples of transition words are given here. So, for the first step, for the second step and next, then following this after, afterwards, subsequently. So, these things you can use to indicate the steps in order to um, talk about the importance of some steps or talk about two things. So, you can use things like most importantly, crucially, additionally, of equal importance, simultaneously, concurrently, while that is happening. When you are concluding, you can use transition words like finally, for the final step, ultimately, before you are done, one last point is and so on. So, if you go back to this example, uh, how to remove bubble gum. So, the writer here uses the transition word first. So, this is just an example. So, if you are talking about uh, uh, steps in chronological fashion, then we use such transition words like first, second and that becomes very crucial. Okay. So, a process analysis thesis should contain two elements. So, one the main point of the analysis 
and second the organizational format for exploring the main idea. So, if you recall the introductory paragraph of a longish text ends with the thesis statement. So, the thesis statement includes the main topic and also gives clues about the organization of the rest of the essay. So, let us look at some examples here. Building a table is a simple three stage process of cutting, assembling and finishing. So, what does this thesis statement mean? Obviously, the rest of the text is going to talk about this process, how you build a table, but there are other words also here. So, it says it is a simple process. So, it is a kind of reassuring the person who is performing it that it is going to be an easy process and then it also mentions there are mainly three stages and what are these three stages? They are also listed here cutting, assembling and finishing. So, you can expect that each of these three things are taken up in um, three successive paragraphs. Let us look at another example. Changing a tire does not require a mechanic skill. On the contrary, a 10 year old child can do it. So, here the writer wants to emphasize on the ease of the process. So, by bringing up this factor that even a 10 year child can do. Let us look at another example. The overly complicated registration procedure forces students to waste time standing in long lines. So, if you use this as your thesis statement, you are going to focus on how complicated this registration procedure is. So, by giving clues about the ease or the difficulty of the process in the thesis statement itself, you are preparing your reader to read the rest of the things accordingly. Now, you can choose one of these topics and you can prepare your own process description. I will give very brief clues about each of these topics. So, first one how to break a bad habit directional. So, imagine one of your friends has a bad habit something like waking up very late in the day and therefore, your friend misses classes in the morning. So, how to break this? Now, you need to think of a series of steps these again could be chronological or this could be according to their relative importance. So, some of the steps could be uh, prepare a timetable of your routine, then set alarm clocks with multiple intervals say like 6, 6 5, 6 10 and so on. Go to bed early, uh, listen to music at night, this makes you fresh, wake up early and go for jogging. So, these kinds of steps you can include here. The next is how to become rich. So, here again, so what a person um, can do or should do to become rich. So, note here this has uh, uh, clearly very personal nature. So, the points you suggest depend on your own opinions and your values. So, you may suggest simply study well, uh, get into a good uh, company, uh, work hard and eventually you become rich or you may say something like you have a very 
clear financial management, you invest money in stocks, you take up multiple jobs, you save money, um, have a clear budget uh, and so on. The third one, any natural or scientific phenomenon you are familiar with, this is informational. So, you are familiar with a scientific phenomena or a natural phenomena, say something like how earthquakes occur or how a tsunami occurs. And you are writing this process analysis for people who do not know about it. So, people may be from diverse backgrounds. So, the idea here is you need to keep your process uh, description as simple as possible. We have gone through several uh, techniques, several measures we need to take something like defining technical terms, um, using short sentences, neat paragraphing and so on. So, using that you can explain any one of the scientific or natural phenomena you are familiar with. So, first you need to make list of the all the steps involved in it and then go about each one of it in a very simple and neat fashion. So, in conclusion today we have looked at process analysis. So, it means this is the description of a process. A process could be as simple as making a cup of coffee or withdrawing money from an ATM or it could be as complex as we saw how containment works in a nuclear reactor. So, there are basically two types when you are writing a process analysis. The one is directional, particularly in user manuals. So, you need to explain these steps in a simple and neat manner, use polite commands and give as many details as possible. You may also write about a scientific or natural phenomena for general public, so that you are telling them about how something happens. So, this is you know informational process analysis, here we do not use commands, instead we use short sentences and we talk about each step very carefully and define technical terms any involved, so that people do not have any difficulties in understanding it. Thank you.